see everybody today. Uh, let's stand and worship for a little while together. Shall we? It's in the hymnal. The first one's number two. There it is. It's up there too.
Thank you, Rach, for leading us in worship this morning. Thank you, Greg. Thank you all for worshiping with us. We didn't get a chance to talk to you at the door on the way in. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Three quick uh, announcements, and then we'll move into prayer time and our further worship. There's a display out there in the foyer about Bible school. It's coming up the first full week of June. That'll be here before we know it. March is on Tuesday. <laughs> so we're moving right along. Speaking of March, we're moving right along. But um, the clinic, the Bible school clinic, is March the 12th up in Mount Vernon. So if you'd like to help, be part of our Bible school team. Some details are out there about that. Or you can contact Casey or Alicia. Their phone numbers are there. Need all the help we can get. And hopefully you'll be one of our helpers and we'll be able to go to the clinic as well. So keep that in mind. Be praying about that. And then a uh, week from tomorrow night, the associational meeting is here. You see the details about that. Or you can talk to Debbie Giacomo. I'm sure she'll be able to give you some input. And then a week from tomorrow night, I mean a week from tonight, March the 6th, is the Here's Your One rally up at O'Fallon. We'll be leaving the parking lot four-ish, so we'd like to have as many people come and go with us as possible um, to the Who's Your One rally. That's a major soul-winning and evangelistic emphasis of the Southern Baptist Convention. Who's your one? Who would you like to see come to Jesus this year? And so that's what that's all about. I'd love to have a good group go up there with us. You pray about that and see what God says. So let's pray together, and then we'll continue our worship. Father, as we come, thanking you for what we've already done in our worship time, thanking you for each one that's here, those that are watching online that couldn't be here because of illness or the weather or whatever. We just pray, God, you'd remind us that we're here to worship, we're gathered to worship you, and as we just sang, you're worthy of worship. And we know, as I talked about last week, as we talked about from time to time, we have freedom to worship, and it's a wonderful thing. And as we've seen this week in the events of this world, Freedom can quickly be taken away unexpectedly. And so we, as best as we can, with our limited knowledge of the situation, lift up people in the Ukraine in this uh, situation. We don't know everything about it. Some of us have sat before the various news agencies or looked it up on the internet in our particular news feed, and we've got an idea about the politi political of it, the military of it, and the economic of it. But really, Lord, we, we don't know a thimble of the ocean of it when we come right down to it. But we do know that something evil has been done. And uh, so we come against that in Jesus' name and ask that you would do what only you can do for these poor people and their families which have been separated and their, their lives that have been upended. And I was telling Allison, we've talked about it over the last few days, it's almost like Texas invaded Oklahoma. It's, it's something like that. And we couldn't imagine something like that in our country. And yet it's happened. And we don't know where all that's gonna go, but we know that you do. And so we submit this need. We pray especially, Lord, uh, against this maniacal dictator and that you would move and sit him down however you choose to do that, that's your business. But we ask that it would cease and desist sooner rather than later for all the, the innocents who are caught in the middle. And uh, we know that you love them, whether they know you or not. So we pray for that aspect of it. Uh, our side of the pond, Lord, we pray for our president Secretary of State, military advisors, economic advisors. We pray that you would give them wisdom at this time. These are the kind of situations that nobody knows how to prepare for. So there's a lot of uh, around the corner things that we can't see just yet, but you, we know that you're there. So we just lift it up to you, God. Help us to pray as you lay it on our heart, as uh, we see human suffering, in places where we've never been and probably will never go. But suffering's the same where we are. And uh, bloodshed and hurt and heartbreak, you know all about that. And so we pray that you touch these people, uh, Ukrainians and Russians alike, uh, wherever they may be this morning on this whole particular conflict. We pray that you'd have your will and you'd have your way. 
and you'd help us to look up knowing that our redemption draws nigh. In Jesus' name. Rob contacted me earlier this week and asked me to sing this song. I got it out and it's on tape. I was going to have Greg convert it to CD and I, it wouldn't, wouldn't work. I realized how long it was. I started singing this song 35 years ago, but I think it's more, definitely more important today than it was then. And it was very important then. So. Of a mighty rushing wind, and it's closer now than it's ever been. I can almost hear the trumpet. At the midnight cry, we'll be going home when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children. The dead in Christ shall run. See prophecies fulfilling, and the signs of the times, they're appearing everywhere. I can almost hear the Father. your children and at that midnight cry the bride of Christ will rise when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children Midnight cry when 
Jesus comes again When Jesus comes again Appropriate song for the times and appropriate song for the message as we turn to Revelation chapter 4. You've been tracking with us. We're looking through the book of Revelation in reference to the church, the Lord and his church. So we saw the Lord of the church in chapter 1, and then we saw the churches in chapters 2 and 3. And this morning, the scene shifts. And that's a big thing when you're reading through or studying through the book Revelation. you got to know where you are. <laughs> I think it's 15 or 16 times in the book, John's perspective changes. Sometimes he's on earth looking up at heaven. Sometimes he's in heaven looking down at earth. Sometimes he's on earth looking at earth. And sometimes he's in heaven looking at heaven. So it helps to know where John is. He's sort of our tour guide for coming attractions and probably nearer than we could ever imagine. So in chapter 4, verse 1, we see this statement. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. The first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet, talking with me and said, come up here and I'll show you things which must be hereafter. Chapter 3, specifically verse 20, ends with a closed door. Jesus standing on the outside of the church trying to get in. Chapter 4 begins with an open door. And John is figuratively and symbolically a picture of what we call, what Todd just said about, the rapture of the church. Notice it begins with the words after this and it concludes with the words hereafter twice. Now turn back to chapter 1 verse 19. I didn't start with this because I knew we was going to get there unless the rapture happened first and it didn't, so here we are. <laughs> but in chapter 1 verse 19 you have the outline of the book. Jesus said to John, write the things which you've seen, that's chapter 1, the things which are, that's chapter 2 and 3, we call that the church age, and then the things which shall be hereafter. There it is. So that word hereafter in verse 19, same word we see twice in chapter 4, verse 1, means that the next event on God's calendar is the rapture of the church. And as Todd's saying, the rapture of the church is a combination of two things. Number one, it is the rising again or the calling again up of the dead in Christ. The body's in the ground, the person is in heaven with Jesus, absent from the body, present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, 8. And then also, those of us who are living, some people will be alive when that trumpet sounds, and they will never physically die, and they'll be caught up together. Somebody said, why does the dead in Christ go first? Well, they got six feet farther to come. <laughs> That's why. So they get a head start. But we'll all be caught up together in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Those two groups, the dead in Christ, the living believers, comprise what is called the body of Christ on earth, the church. They will become the bride of Christ in heaven, as you just heard sung about. Let me give you a couple of references. You can write these down and read them later. This is not a message on the rapture, but the rapture is going to take us out of this world into the presence of the throne. And we'll get there in just a minute. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about more than the rapture, talks about the resurrection order, talks about the resurrection body. That's a wonderful chapter. And then 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, where Paul talks about some of the details that I've just mentioned. And he said this is something that should comfort us, the fact that we belong to the Lord, and he's going to call us out Amen. without a sign. I know there's signs. We watch the signs. But... We're not looking for the signs. We're looking for the Savior. Yeah. We're not looking for Antichrist. We're looking for Jesus Christ. That ought to be our posture as we live in this world. So prophecy fulfilling shouldn't be something to scare us, but something 
to comfort us and realize just like Paul thought it could happen in his lifetime, Peter thought it could happen in his lifetime, John thought it could happen in his lifetime, these churches we looked at the last several weeks thought it could happen in their lifetime, it could happen in our lifetime. Some people say, preacher, I've been hearing that all my life. That's right. The rapture of the church is meant to make us ready to keep us right, to keep us close to the Lord, to help us to wake up and repent if we need to and be as right with him as we know how to be when that trumpet sounds. So after the rapture of the church, chapter 4, verse 1, notice the voice of a trumpet. He said, that's the voice I heard at first. That's chapter 1, verse 10. You can go back and read it. Jesus' voice was like a trumpet when John heard him talk, and it's that same voice. This is different than the seven trumpets of judgment. In fact, you won't find the church at all in Revelation 6 through 18 because the church is in heaven having a holy honeymoon, the marriage supper of the Lamb, it's called, in other places in the Bible, while on earth the great tribulation begins. So the rapture is Jesus calling his church unto himself. I want to emphasize that because instantly the rapture will happen, but there will still be a church on earth. But Revelation 17 and 18 calls it the great whore or the harlot, if you have a newer translation, a little bit softer. There will be unredeemed church members who will still be here. Can you imagine if you were in a building on a Sunday morning and the rapture happened and suddenly 30 people were gone or 70 people were gone and you were still sitting there? That would be shocking, wouldn't it? But there are unredeemed people in every denominational group. I don't care if they're Baptist or they're Pentecostal or if they're Catholic or whatever name you want to put on the label. That doesn't matter. It's what's in the jar that counts. Do you have Jesus on the inside? Amen. Amen. So the rapture, that's our hope. Paul calls it the blessed hope there in Titus and other places. And John is a picture of that. Notice what he says in verse 2. Immediately. Instantly, in a moment, Paul says, in the twinkling of an eye, will be caught up to the throne. Now, throne is a big, big theme in the book of Revelation. 46 times, depending on which version you read, the word throne appears in this book. 17 times in these two chapters, chapter 4 and chapter 5. Three quarters of all the references to a throne in the New Testament happen in this book. And I want us to think about this throne. He says, verse 2, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven. Did you know Christianity is the only religion, and I'm using that in a comparative sense, we know Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship with God through his son Jesus Christ. But for talking points, Christianity is the only religion that has a throne. Islam has no throne. Buddhism knows nothing of a throne. Hinduism is absent when it comes to a throne. Atheism has no throne. Secular humanism has no religion has a throne because no religion has a savior, because no religion has a God, because no religion has a king but Christianity. We have a throne that we look to, that we pray to, that we long for. So he says, immediately I was in the spirit and I saw a throne. Notice first the set throne in heaven. This declares the sovereignty of God and the certainty of his plan being accomplished on planet earth. Some of you had concrete. You know, there's time you can work your concrete and then your concrete's set. <laughs> and then you're in trouble. That's the idea here. Throne set in heaven. Worldwide pandemic, there's a throne set in heaven. Russia invades Ukraine, there's a throne set in heaven. Kamala Harris becomes the next president of the United States, there's a throne set in heaven. Donald Trump's reelected president of the United States, there's a throne set in heaven. Whoever's going to be the next president of the United States, and boy, won't he or she inherit a mess? Throne set in heaven. 
Your spouse dies of cancer. There's a throne set in heaven. You divorce a throne set in heaven. Your granddaughter says, I want to be a boy. There's a throne set in heaven. Your house burns down. There's a throne set in heaven. The tornado comes. The hurricane happens. Uncertainty, confusion. There's a throne set in heaven. Don't miss it, my brother. Don't miss it, my sister. At some point in your life and mine, we've got to come to this throne set in heaven and realize no matter what it may look like, no matter what it may feel like, God is on the throne. And he's working all things. That means the good, the bad, and the ugly things. He's working all things together for our good. Amen. There's a throne set in heaven. Ray Stedman's a pastor, been in heaven for many years. He's out there in Palo Alto, California. And I heard him tell a story one time. He was over in England at a missions conference. And all these missionaries were there, hundreds and hundreds of them. It was a wonderful time. And they were singing the song, Our God Reigns. 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 So they were singing this and worshiping the Lord. And he said they looked down at their song sheet. They didn't have computers and screens and video technology back then. They just had the words on the little song sheets. And he said he kind of glanced down at the song sheet while all these hundreds of people were singing, Our God reigns, worshiping God. And he said somebody who typed it up had made a mistake, typo. And the title said, Our God resigns. <laughs> And he thought, how about that? Our God doesn't resign Amen. because something happened over in Russia that didn't happen last week. He wasn't surprised. Our God doesn't resign because there's a pandemic. Our God doesn't resign because something happened in your life this week that made you question God's love, question God's care, question God's will. Never forget there's a set throne in heaven. The very first thing John sees, the very first thing you and I will see when we're caught out of this mess into heaven is a set throne. And then, notice secondly, not only a set throne, but one seated on the set throne in heaven. He says there in verse 2, I saw one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like jasper and a sardius stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. John sees the throne. He doesn't see a body. He only sees brilliance. He doesn't see a form. He only sees the, the fullness of God. He doesn't see a shape. He just sees the Shekinah glory of God. He sees the colors, these impressive colors. Jasper is like our diamond. And you've ever looked at a diamond, the light just gleams off of it with the many facets. And it speaks of the righteousness of God. He's always right. He always does everything right. He's totally right, even when we don't understand, even when we question, even when we're angry, even when we're confused. He's right. He's sitting on the center throne, adjudicating the affairs of the universe. And so his righteousness. And then there's sardius or carnelian. It's a red stone, like a like our deep ruby or a garnet for you ladies that know your jewel stones, your, your uh, different kind of stones. And it speaks of the blood, our redemption. So he sees God in his righteousness, always doing what's right. He sees God in his redemptiveness, saving us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And then he sees this, this funky, groovy rainbow. I love this. He says there's a rainbow round about the throne like an emerald. It's a big green rainbow. It's a halo rainbow. I like to call it a rainbowville. <laughs> it's a rainbow oval. It's a rainbowville. And it's green. It speaks of the eternality of God. Ever green. Always green. This rainbow. And you may have a study Bible. I know some of you do. The Greek word for rainbow here is the word iris. Not the flower, but what's in your eyeball. 
So you've got your pupil, if you can imagine that, that's God's throne. And all the way around it, the colored part, that's the rainbow. That's the iris. That's the halo rainbow. When we look at rainbows, they're broken. We only see half of it. The earth has broken the rainbow. God made a promise to Noah, and they're going to flood the earth again. But the promise is broken by us. We don't keep the covenant. God keeps the covenant. And so the earth breaks the rainbow. Sin breaks the rainbow. We break the rainbow, but God doesn't. And in heaven, it's an unending, eternal circle. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord? But no, unbroken circle in heaven. This halo rainbow. <laughs> and if you want to continue the eyeball illustration, God's throne's like your pupil. And then this setting uh, there around it is like the iris. And then notice the third thing. There's not only a set throne in heaven and one sitting on the set throne in heaven, but then there's a setting around the one sitting on the set throne in heaven. I couldn't say that again if I tried. Look at verse 5. He says, out of the throne were lightnings, thunders, Voices and seven lamps burning, which are the seven spirits of God. Again, appears several times in the book. Doesn't mean seven Holy Spirits. It means the Holy Spirit in his unhindered fullness. If you want to see those seven manifestations, turn back to Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. They're right there. The sevenfold, full manifestation of the Spirit in heaven. And then he says, before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal and We'll continue in just a second. So you see there the, the lightnings, the thunderings, the, the violent up-chucking, up-turning. Something's fixing to break out on planet Earth. The church is caught up in the presence of God, and now the great tribulation is rumbling. But even though it is, there's a glassy sea. There's the Holy Spirit. There's tranquility in heaven. Again, God's not angry. He's not unleashing some kind of despotic, tyrannical invasion. He's simply going to judge the earth because it's time. And it's going to be perfectly in tune with his nature and character. Do you realize if God judges or if God forgives, he's still God. He is who he is. Sometimes we get angry. We lash out. We may be right or justified in our, not God. His anger, his judgment, his love, his forgiveness are motivated in perfect measure. He's God. He's the one who sits alone on the center throne of the universe. And so the setting tells us what's going to happen next on planet Earth. But also in heaven. Notice there in verse 4, there's these 24 elders. And then in verse 6, 7, and 8, there's these four living creatures. Let's look at them real quick. These 24 elders. Now, there's 13. I looked them up. There's 13 different opinions about who these guys are. <laughs> so there's a lot of biblical speculation. But it appears to me that these 24 elders represent the church, represent the totality of God's redeemed humanity. You notice there in verse 4, they have white raiment, which is... Uh, righteousness. We'll see that later on in the book. White linen. Righteousness. We have righteousness imputed to us. Our righteousness, Isaiah said, is what? Filthy rags. So we need a righteousness we don't have. Good news. God gives us the righteousness we don't have, but we need through Jesus Christ. That's the only way we get to heaven, through his righteousness. So there it is. Crowns of gold, the word crown there is not the word diadem. It's the word Stephanos. We get the word Stephen from that. The, the Stephanos crown was that laurel wreath that they placed on the head of the Olympic athlete. It was a temporary crown. And of course, it represents when we get to heaven, to the marriage supper of the Lamb, we will be rewarded for what we've done in this life in service to our King. That's why it's important to serve Jesus, people. Because one day you're going to stand at the throne. We're all going to be there. And you're going to be rewarded based on your faithfulness. Some of us have lots of opportunities. Some of us not so many. Some of us have many obstacles to overcome. Some of us just a few. 
God knows all about it. We'll all be rewarded. But the word crown there is a word reserved for servants. The diadem only is given to God alone. You know, we sing that old hymn, crown him with many crowns, the Lord upon his throne. And the diadem is his crown. So these crowns represent our rewards for our faithfulness to God in service, our faithfulness to God in sacrifice, our faithfulness to God in suffering, our faithfulness to God to follow him no matter what. And one day that will all be rewarded. He knows all about it, and he cares. He really does. So that's the 24 elders. Then we get into these beasts, these uh, living creatures. The word there in verse 7 is zoe. Zoe means eternal life. We get the word zoo from this. Nobody goes to the zoo to look at dead animals. <laughs> you go to look at living things, not stuffed things. A couple years ago, we was in Cincinnati, uh, visiting with Allison's family, and we went to the Cincinnati Zoo, and the big draw at that time was this baby hippo. I can't remember the hippo's name right now, Lucy or Susie or Wendy. or I can't remember her name right now. But people were lined up five wide and ten deep to see that little baby hippo come out. They let it out every hour, every hour and a half, or something like that. And people would flood around. Of course, here they are. They got their phones out. And here comes this little bitty old hippo looking around. And everybody like, what in the heck is going on? <laughs> it was almost coming. But we go to the zoo to see stuff. And that is this word, unfortunately translated beast in, in the King James Version, probably more properly translated living creature in some of your uh, newer translations. Now, this is a composite of the angel, the angelic creatures. We sung about cherubim and seraphim here a minute ago. You find them in Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel 1 specifically. These particular angelic creatures don't have all the characteristics of the ones we find in Isaiah or Ezekiel, but they have some of both. So angels is a big mystery, but these are angelic beings unlike any other, and they are assigned to the throne. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine right now because I haven't had lunch yet. I'm a little foggy. But when he saw this, they were around the throne. For the last 2,000 years, they've been around the throne. This morning, they're around the throne. This is what they do. This is their thing. One looks like a lion, one looks like a calf, one's got a face like a man, and one a flying eagle. You'll see that in Ezekiel chapter 1 if you compare the, the passages. Some Bible scholars, and I would agree with this, draw the four Gospels from this, that these four angelic creatures, these four living creatures, reflect the truths told through the four Gospels. In Matthew, Jesus is presented as the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Messiah, the king. In uh, Mark, he's presented as the ox or the calf, the suffering servant, the one who bears the burden. In Luke, he's pictured as the son of man. Luke tells the birth story of Jesus Christ and focuses on Jesus' humanity. And then in John, the flying eagle, the son of God. Nothing can hinder him. And so there is, in these four beasts, some sort of representation in heaven of what we have been told on earth in the fourfold portrait of Jesus Christ in the gospel. They, they've got six wings and they, they got eyes all around. I mean, their eyes are always on what? The throne. No matter where they fly, they always see the throne. They're always occupied with the throne. They're focused on the throne. They can't stop looking at the throne. And they fly, and they say, and they sing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And they sing that over and over and over and over, and it never gets old. By the way, Bible students, the only time in the Bible an attribute of God is stated in Trinitarian form. He's holy, holy, Holy. The Bible never says he's love, love, love. He is. Or he's mercy, mercy, mercy. He is. Or he's truth, truth, truth. He is. But the Bible does say he's holy, holy, holy. And around and around and around they fly and they look at that throne and 
is. They fly, look at that throne. They sing over and over and over and over and over. And verse 10 says, when these 24 elders see these angelic creatures soaring around the throne, focusing on the throne, singing to the one who sits on the throne, they fall down before the center throne. They fall down and they cast their crowns down and they worship in unison forever and ever and ever. <laughs> if you're a Christian, this is your next stop. This is your next place. This is your next reality. And it's because of that I want us to think this morning about throne thoughts. Throne thoughts. You probably didn't think about the throne this week. And to be honest with you, had I not been preparing this message, I probably wouldn't have either. We're so beat down. We're so broke down by life and hurt, pain and stress and uncertainty. We're losing our perspective on life. We're inundated with earthly things and family mess and physical pain and problems which are real. But at some point, we have got to get back to the throne of God. We've got to get back to the fact that no matter what's going on in our lives or in this world, there's God sitting on a throne. He's got it under control. He's still on the throne, and he does reign. He's not going to resign. <laughs> so jot down quickly seven words, and I'll be quick. These are seven areas of our life that as believers, we've got to have throne thoughts. We've got to let the throne change our thinking. Too many of us are guilty of what's been called stinking thinking. <laughs> the problem in most of our lives is right here in between our ears. And we've got to realize that from God's perspective, the rapture happens and we're at the throne. He sees us already on the throne. He sees us not only justified and sanctified, but he sees us glorified, risen, sitting in heavenly places. That's God's perspective. And that's what John saw when he went up. And so we've got to look at life not from the earth up. We've got to look at life from heaven down. We've got to change our thinking. Number one, now I'll start with a W. <laughs> the word is worship. Hopefully you caught that a little bit in my fervor this morning. Verse 10 says they worship. The one thing that we do in heaven that we also do on earth. Does our worship, which is not just singing on Sunday morning, although that's part of it, it involves all of our life. Worship, a uh, uh, living sacrifice presented to God, as Paul would say in Romans chapter 12, and you get that way by the renewing of your mind. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. But is our earthly worship informed and instructed by heaven? Or do we just sort of drag ourselves around trying to sing the next song? Trying to make it through the next day? And I understand that. I understand that. But the worship of heaven, the thinking of worship, the thoughts around the throne of worship must cause us to repent of wimpy worship and, and to begin to worship God for who he is and for what he's done and for what he's doing and for what he's going to do. We need an elevated viewpoint of our worship, not only on Sunday morning, but on Tuesday afternoon at the job and on Thursday night at home where we worship him in all the different aspects and areas and attitudes of our life in such a way as that people see a difference in our life, a difference in our voice, a difference in our choices. Number two, the word is witness. Witness. As a Christian, we're witnessing, telling others about Jesus, helping them to know the one that we know, the one that they need to know. Uh, next Sunday night, we're going to go up to O'Fallon for our rally to try to, to encourage people to become more involved in reaching somebody for Jesus Christ, to become engaged in praying for them, being burdened for them, and helping them to know. When witnessing happens here, it's over. When the rapture, no witnessing in heaven, we're there. So if we're going to witness, we've got to do it now. And that's a big part of coming out of the pandemic for every church. How are we going to reach people? 
How are we going to share the gospel? How are we going to bring them to faith in Jesus Christ? And the throne, gathering around the throne of God and getting throne strategies for how to reach into the people pockets that God places us is an important thing. Our witnessing, our sharing will be transformed as we think about the throne, the set throne in heaven, the one sitting on the set throne in heaven, the setting around the one city <laughs> in the set throne in heaven. Number three, the words walk. Holy, holy, holy. How's your walk with God? Is it a holy walk? I didn't say perfect. I didn't say without problems. But are we walking holy? Are we allowing worldly, earthly things to cause us not to walk as close to Jesus as we should, as he desires, as we used to? He's holy, holy, holy. Never forget, the Holy Spirit's first name is holy. <laughs> so if we're filled with the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, there will be a holiness. Not a holier-than-a-thou attitude, not some hyper-religiosity, not the length of hair and the length of skirts, not a legalism, not a religiosity, but a true holiness that says, Jesus, you're my Savior, you're my Redeemer, I'm soon going to be with you. Help me to walk with you today. Help me to love others in your name today. Help me to do what you would have me to do today. Holiness. Number four, works. Works. What are you doing for Jesus. We often say these crowns, these rewards for service, happen with our time, our talent, and our treasure. What do we do with our time? Is one hour on Sunday morning what I give to God? Or am I involved with spending other time with God in devotional time or serving Him in some way? How do I serve Him in the church? Do I work in the nursery? Do I teach a Sunday school class? Am I involved in a welcome team? Am I involved in some other way? These are all things for us to consider because the crowns are given in direct proportion to service rendered. Works. Number five, wisdom. Wisdom. We all need it now more than ever. And knowledge is knowing what. Earthly wisdom is knowing how, but godly wisdom is knowing why. That's the kind of wisdom we really need. We need to know why. Why are we here? What are we doing with the life that God has given us? Give, give me wisdom, Lord, to make the right choices, to, to take advantage of, to make the most of the opportunities. Help me to invest in eternity. Give me wisdom, God. I want my life to outlive me. I want my life to last after I'm gone. Help me, Lord, to know how to disciple others, to pour into the lives of other people. Help me, Lord, to know what to do now. Life is so confusing. It's so weird. It's so bizarre. Everything is so out of shape, out of place. Lord, I need wisdom. I need your will. That's number six, the will of God. What are we going to do as a church? What are you going to do as a believer in the future? Are you just going to continue to move chairs around, rearrange furniture with your life? Or is your life going to count? I think it was Mark Twain who said the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you figured out why. A profound statement for an agnostic. <laughs> but there's a day more important than that. That's the day you accept Jesus. Because when you accept Jesus, you're born again. You're going to heaven. And he'll help you figure out why. Yeah. Number seven, the word is wonder. Not wonder like, what's going on? <laughs> but wonder. When you read this chapter, you can't be filled. You can't help but be filled with wonder. You read this description. And John, all through the book, he's saying, I saw and it looked like and it appeared as. And he's just grasping for adjectives and adverbs. He's, he's searching for comparison. He's using the most lofty, spirit-inspired language on earth. And he says, I can't talk about it. It's too awesome for me. Wonder. And everything he says, everything we read, as fascinating as it is, it's less than the reality. You've heard somebody describe something, a trip somewhere, an experience with something, and you thought, wow. Then you actually did it. You actually saw it. It was like, 
beyond what she said, more than what he's, that's, that's John. He's doing the very best he can with a limited earthly vocabulary to talk about the throne. And it creates in him this sense of wonder. We need that. And the throne, if we think about God's throne, we dwell upon the throne, if we meditate on the throne, it will cultivate in us, again, that sense of wonder. You know, that wonder of a little child, so precious, so powerful. When you see them, when you hear them, the sense of wonder of life. And then we grow and we get old on the inside. We become jaded, hurt, fragmented. What's going to bring us back to the sense of wonder and the fact that God is awesome and powerful and wonderful? It's the throne. It's the throne. It's the throne of God. So, my beloved brothers and sisters, as we move forward in this brave new world, don't lose the wonder. Come to the throne. See where you're going and allow it to guide you as you get there. Verse 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things for Thy pleasure. They are, and they were, created. Lucas is going to put that verse up on the screen, our memory verse for this week, in a chorus form. And before we sing it together, and then come to the Lord's table, I must say this. This throne set in heaven is not the only throne of God we see in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 20, there's another throne. It's called the Great White Throne of Judgment. This throne, chapter 4, is for God's people, those redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. The throne in Revelation 20 is for everyone else. It's a throne of judgment. The throne we're reading is a throne of celebration. But their throne in Revelation 20 is a throne of damnation. Chapter 4 is a throne in heaven. Chapter 20 is a throne that leads to hell. And here's the last thing I want to say before I teach you this little chorus, if you don't already know it. Each of us here this morning, all of us watching by way of the World Wide Web, we're only one heartbeat away from the throne. Amen. One throne or the other. We're only one breath away from eternal heaven or eternal hell. And today, as the world dips into one more death spiral, which throne is your next stop? Are you going to heaven's throne? Praise the Lord. If you're not, Jesus says, come unto me. Bring your sin to me. I will take your sin to the cross. And you can come to my throne as well. Now, this is based on Revelation 4.11. If you know it, you can sing with me. If not, we'll go through it a couple of times. Then we'll pray and come to the Lord's table, which, of course, is a picture of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord. Thou art worthy to receive glory, glory.
so that our minds can be instructed by your eternal wisdom so that we may know how to live in this lost and dying world in such a way as people could see Jesus and want him and want his throne. They want to escape the throne of judgment and be seated around his throne, worshiping him. For thou art worthy, O Lord. Now, Father, as we come to the table, help us to focus. Help us to be like those wild, heavenly creatures. Help us to get our eyes on you, our spiritual focus on you. Help us to fix our hearts on you. Help us, Lord, to worship you as we come down to the tail end of this service this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. On the screen, we'll have a song of worship. What we're going to do is sing this first verse. As the elements are distributed, and then when everybody's received, we'll sing the second verse together, and then we'll partake, and then we'll stand and sing the third verse, and we'll get on out of here this morning. Amen? Amen.
Jesus said on the night he was betrayed, this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Then he said this cup is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the remission of sins. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death until I come. This do in remembrance of me. <laughs> now let's stand together. Pass your cups to the center. And we'll sing this third and final verse as a benediction. It's been good to be with you today. God bless you.